everyone, good evening and uh, good evening to Julie Pace, our guest for this interview on the challenges of covering the Capitol riots. Hi, Julie. Hi, thank you so much for having me. So Julie is a Washington bureau chief for the AP, overseeing more than 100 journalists. Prior to that, she was AP's chief White House correspondent, covering the presidencies of both Barack Obama and Donald Trump. She joined the AP in 2007 as a multimedia reporter covering presidential politics. She also worked as a multimedia reporter in the Tampa T Tribune and ETV, uh, the first independent television station in South Africa. Julie is a native of Buffalo, New York, and a graduate of Northwestern University. University uh, School of Journalism, and she lives in Washington, of course. Uh, thank you for joining us, Julie. I'm sure you're very busy. <laughs> Happy to be here. So let's talk about January 6th. Uh, can you go back to this very unusual day in the office and in the country uh, and share with us the atmosphere and decision-making processes behind the scene? Absolutely. So going into the 6th, we knew that this was going to be a really intense day. This was the day when lawmakers in Congress were going to be going through what is normally a pretty perfunctory process, essentially validating the results of the election. This isn't something that normally gets a lot of attention in the U.S. It's, it's really just supposed to be a rubber stamp. Um, but obviously, with the uh, baseless claims that Trump was making about the election, um, this suddenly became um, a really pivotal, mo pivotal moment, and he was pushing for his supporters in Congress uh, and Vice President Mike Pence to essentially overturn the will of the American electorate. So we were already going into this day knowing that this was going to be hugely significant. Uh, Trump had planned to do a rally outside the White House where a lot of his supporters would be there. Um, so all of that had us really on guard. There was also a ton of security already around Washington um, in anticipation of some type of march or protest. And that's what everyone thought at that time that it would essentially be. Uh, and I remember, you know, we were all working virtually. I was working here in my home office uh, when this was all unfolding. And we had really spent a lot of time thinking about our staff that was going to be up on the hill, um, where they were going to be, where they would park. You know, we had a buddy system arranged for them. So we certainly knew that this had the potential to be um, a pretty tense day. Uh, but as it unfolded, you know, it took a direction that I don't think any of us could have predicted. And, and I really do remember uh, you know, watching the images unfold live and starting to realize that this was turning into something much more than a protest, um, that this was turning into something much more than um, an expression of, of grievance from Trump supporters, that this was becoming violent. Um, and I was getting a lot of dispatches from my team that was in the Capitol, um, and they were also kind of realizing this in real time. I think one of the things now that is interesting to look back on is that, you know, we have such a clearer picture of what that day looks like. But in the moment, you were just sort of piecing together these individual data points. And, and, and I do think it took us a little while to realize uh, what we were dealing with. And, and ultimately what we were dealing with was an insurrection, a, a riot on the, on the US Capitol and an attempt to overturn a free and fair election, which is you know still a couple months out from it, still a pretty remarkable thing to say. So you were actually working remotely, the whole office, while this was going on, which is- It was really bad. difficult. It was really difficult. You know, we had, um, as I mentioned, a small team that was in and around the Capitol, um, reporters, photographers, video journalists, but most of us were working remotely. We've been um, working remotely since the middle of March of, uh, of 2020. Um, because of the pandemic. And so that's one of the things that honestly made it a lot more difficult is that you know you were at, you were having to deal with just the lo the logistics of of being all separated. and and you know for for reporters and and journalists, you know that in a breaking news situation, it's just so much easier to be together. You know, you can be talking in real time, have that free flow of conversation happening. You can be comparing notes, running across the newsroom. You know, hey, did you see this? I just heard from this person. And we were having to do it all over Zoom and cell phones and uh, Slack and email. And uh, it was the one day, you know, I, I look back at this past year and I think we've done pretty well 
being remote, um, it was the one day that I really missed being in the newsroom because I think that while I'm, I'm certainly deeply proud of our coverage, and I think from the outside, um, it probably didn't look like it was any more cumbersome. Um, it just, it, it made a challenging day that much more difficult for us to be remote. For sure, it's really hard to imagine, you know, a news desk uh, working remotely. Um, but can you share with us maybe a little bit more about the dilemmas around uh, the content or uh, more precisely uh, the framing um, of the events? Uh, you said that at the beginning you weren't so sure, you know, what exactly is happening. But it became clearer, uh, you know, as events unfolded. Um, so, so what about really the, the framing of the situation? I mean, we know the AP has, you know, a certain language and um, is considered, you know, very cautious in, in, in its report. So how do you frame such a qu crazy event with, you know, cautious wording? Well, and this was one of the first things we had to figure out is what we were going to call this, you know, what was unfolding. And we started um, in, the, in the sort of early moments, um, we were describing it as a protest. You know, this is the point in which uh, Trump supporters are walking from the White House to the Capitol. They're arriving. They're outside the building still. And we're, we're calling it a, a protest or a demonstration. And, you know, we stuck with that wording for a little while. And then I remember there were these, these scenes that we started to see um, that were pretty violent. Um, there were, there were um, some clashes between um, me members of the media and Trump supporters. We had um, some equipment from one of our AP television crews that was destroyed. And so then we started calling it, we upgraded it a bit. Um, this is still sort of early afternoon on the 6th. We started calling it a violent protest. So we upgraded that. And then we got to that moment, though, where the protesters are now storming the Capitol. You know, they've, they've broken into the Capitol. They've broken through police barricades. Um, they are smashing uh, windows in the Capitol, trying to break down doors. They're in the in the uh, offices of members of Congress, and uh, you know we had to pretty quickly decide whether this was a protest or not, still, or whether there was this was something more. And I'm pretty proud of our decision on that because we did move pretty quickly to um, call this a riot and an insurrection. And I think that that was really important because. We had to make clear that this was not just a group of people that was showing up there because they were trying to support their favored candidate. Um, this was a group that was actually trying to, in some cases, harm lawmakers and uh, certainly to, to try to disrupt um, and upend this democratic process. And I think the more video and photos that we've seen and the more eyewitness accounts that we've seen, the clearer it became that this was this was a, a violent riot, and then ultimately, by the end of the day, you know, we learned that it wasn't just violent, but that it was deadly. You know, we had one Capitol police officer who was killed um, in the middle of a riot. We had one of the rioters who was shot and killed by police, and that I think just really, um, really clarified just the 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 extent of what we were dealing with here. Um, you know, many noticed, um, uh, as happens in other events these days, that the storming was covered, uh, tweeted, and broadcasted live on social media uh, by people inside the building, while traditional media struggled to keep up. Um, how does AP operate in these cases? Uh, do you use social um, uh, media live feeds to try, or, or you try uh, to avoid that in order to verify their authenticity and, and content while, on the other hand, risking being too slow? Yeah, no, it's a good question. I mean, I think in this case, we were able to do both. So, you know, we had um, a team of, of reporters and photographers who were inside the Capitol. And so they were, for us, really our, our core, um, our core set of witnesses. Um, our, one of our terrific Pulitzer Prize winning reporter Scotty Applewhite was in the Capitol and uh, refused to leave the House chamber as he was being you know, told by security that he needed to get out. He said, I'm, I'm good. I'm the AP. I'm going to stay. And so he really provided some of the, the first images of the scene in there. So we were able to rely on him and other eyewitness accounts from our journalists inside. But actually, social media was just also this huge advantage that we and other news organizations had because you had lawmakers and staffers who were inside as well, who were tweeting, you know, their accounts of what was happening, tweeting photos and video of what was happening. And that's really how we were able to, to start to get a, a picture of what this looked like inside. And so, 
know, I think actually it was one of those, it was one of those days where um, having access to uh, so much social media content really, I think, worked to our advantage. Obviously, we tried to verify. Obviously, we tried to, um, to not extrapolate from that um, imagery. But I think it was that combination of what we were hearing from our own team and what we were seeing from these lawmakers as they were really like in the moment. I mean, I remember some of those really powerful, powerful early images that we were seeing where you had lawmakers tweeting photos of themselves, you know, huddled, ducked down under their desks or ripping open gas masks, you know, that had been, uh, you know, taped under their chairs and never really used before. You know, it was seeing that imagery that I think really, again, clarified for us that this was so much more than a protest that was unfolding here. You also covered Trump's uh, presidency uh, as a reporter and as an editor. And um, I assume there were quite a lot of dilemmas regarding the appropriate ways to cover some of his uh, statements, which were let's say, you know, uh, blunt lies. And uh, we know some outlets chose to report uh, statements while fact-checking them and highlighting disinformation, and others choose sometimes to ignore completely some of the statements and events. But uh, from here, it seems like um, the claims on election frauds and Trump's uh, imaginary winning, um, they were kind of treated with much more decisiveness uh, by the American press and social media platforms as well, of course, Twitter. Um, so suddenly, most outlets uh, agreed that these lies uh, needed to be uh, framed uh, very clearly as such. Um, was there a similar process in AP? Uh, how did you treat these lies during the presidency, maybe versus the election steal campaign? Yeah, no, it's a good question. And I, I think, you know, it was an evolving process, I think, for a lot of us in the media. I think that there is a, you go into covering any presidency, um, wanting to treat the president with some measure of respect, um, respect it's respect for the office. Um, and you also look at your job as a reporter covering the presidency uh, to certainly try to hold the president accountable um, and to provide context and fact checking. Um, but you also go in expecting that the office of the presidency is going to have the same amount of respect for the truth and the facts. You know, we all go in knowing that they're going to try to spin a version of events to favor them. But I, I, I can't remember a time, you know, before the Trump presidency where there was sort of such little regard for, uh, for the, the facts. Uh, and I do think that that actually was a little bit of a learning curve for those of us in the media to sort of realize we were not dealing with uh, a traditional administration here, to realize that we could do all the fact checking that we wanted and, and the press office and the president didn't care. You know, I mean, you know how it is sometimes if you do a fact check on something that a politician says over and over again, and you keep saying, this is false, this is false. Oftentimes they will back away from it because they want to be believed. They don't want to be um, seen as somebody who is peddling misinformation. And actually that was not the case in this presidency. And so I think we had to adjust to that reality. And it did take, um, it did take a lot of us in the media, I think a little bit of time um, to get there. But I do think by the time we got to uh, the 2020 election, I think that we certainly, you know, at the AP, were in a very good rhythm um, in terms of making sure that we were not putting out false information. Uh, we were not putting out the president's words, um, you know, in isolation. Every time we wrote, you know, something that he was saying that was false, we made clear that in real time we were adding in the proper context, even if that made us a little bit slower um, as we were filing the news. But I do think that what made the situation with the election um, unique, and in some ways, you know, I've, I've, I've said this before, and I, it, people, people sort of get a little surprised when I say this, but in some ways it made it easier, is that this was so clear. This was and dry. Joe Biden won the election and Donald Trump lost the election. And state officials across the country were verifying those results, including several Republican officials in key states like Arizona and Georgia. You had Attorney General Bill Barr, you know, who was a close ally of President Trump, the top law enforcement official in the country, saying, look, there's no sign of fraud, widespread fraud in this election. You had courts across the country uh, with judges, including several that had been nominated by President Trump, who were rejecting these lawsuits over and over and over again. 
So in some ways, this was the easy one. It was so clear. The facts were only lining up on one side of the equation. And so it, it, it gave us just ample evidence to be very blunt and very straightforward. And I also think that the moment the significance of the moment required that of us. You know, this was not uh, for me, for the AP, and I think for a lot of my colleagues in the media, this was not partisan. This was about a fundamental foundation of American democracy, the integrity of our elections. And there was no evidence that the integrity had been challenged. And the only way that it was being challenged was in President Trump's words. And so we, we had to be crystal clear, again, not because we were opposed to him, but because this was so foundational to our democracy. And so while I, I am, uh, I am sorry, I certainly do not look back at that time um, as, uh, as an easy, quiet period of time, the decision to come down so forcefully on the side of the facts, that, that was easy. That was the right thing to do, clearly. I assume also the fact that uh, some channels like Fox News also, you know, had uh, uh, some clear statements about that kind of help, the nonpartisan. Uh, issue. But um, looking uh, backwards, is there anything that you think, I mean, apart from COVID, which, you know, you couldn't really change, but is there anything um, else that you would have maybe done differently? Um, I mean, um, talking about January 6th, but also uh, in general, Trump's presidency. Yeah, look, like I said, I think that I think that there was a bit of slowness on the part of the media to recognize that, you know, we were not dealing with a traditional administration here. And to realize that, you know, just, I think about this from our perspective with the AP, we do, you know, AP news alerts, which I'm sure, you know, most of you are familiar with. These are very short news alerts. You know, we've got limits on the amount of characters that we can put in a news alert. And so, you know, you often find yourself in a breaking news situation when you're covering a presidential press conference and just are saying, President so-and-so says X. And I look back at some of those early news alerts that we filed off of President Trump, and I think, I wish I could take some of those back. We would follow up very quickly with a, a short story, you know, urgent story, making clear that the what he said was inaccurate or lacking in context. But in our modern world where social media is so powerful, once you put that first sentence out, that news alert out, that's the thing that lives, and you can't take that back. And so we got to a point where we we decided if we couldn't fit the full context, if we couldn't fit the fact checking in a news alert, then we wouldn't send the news alert. We just would we would wait and and put something out that had more material in it. But I look back on that and I think you know that's something I wish I could have changed in the early days. You know it was a it was a hard lesson learned and we got there on it. But I I certainly um, I certainly wish we had gotten there faster on it. You know, the other thing I, I, I think about a lot in all of this is, and I think this is a challenge for the media, um, certainly in this country going forward, is, you know, I wish that we as, as journalists would have been clearer with the public about why we were being so aggressive with Trump, uh, you know, in the briefing rooms, in the news conferences, in some of the coverage. I, I think there was this interpretation, certainly among Trump supporters, that we were opposed to him, that this was a, a, a conflict with him, that we, um, we felt, uh, we felt, you know, that we were the opposition to him. And that's, for me personally, and again, for us at the AP, that's never what this was about. This was not about the journalists uh, feeling like we didn't think Trump should be in office or feeling like we had to convince people to vote another way. This was about a really unusual presidency and a president who came into office with less experience than any of his modern predecessors and a team of advisors that was in constant conflict with each other and was were implementing policies that were not fully thought out and were not fully vetted. And we needed to shine a spotlight on that. And I felt strongly that if we sh if we put that spotlight on that reporting, on what was happening behind the scenes at the White House, and Americans still voted for Trump for a second term, fine. That's not, that's, that's not my mission to get people to change their vote, to get people to, to, to change their political persuasions. I just wanted to provide them all of the information, all of the real information that they needed to make that informed decision. And I wanted to make sure that they knew what the facts were. If they could read our facts and say, you know what? It appears as though the president might not be telling the truth on this one, but I'm okay with that. 
then that's on them. That's, that's okay by me. I'm not trying to shape the way you vote. And I wish that we could have been clear about just what our mission was there, because I think ultimately the, the narrative became for a lot of Trump supporters that we were just so viscerally opposed to him. And that really limited our ability uh, to, I think, provide some factual information to a lot of Trump supporters. They, they, kind of shut us out because they thought that we um, had this this uh, personal opposition to him. And that really wasn't the case. And so I, I, I hope going forward, as we think about coverage of, of this presidency and other presidents, that we can make it a little less personal um, and really focus in, on explaining for the public what our mission really is. That's actually a very interesting point because, I mean, if... Um journalism's uh, job is, you know, to present the facts and let people, you know, choose um, based on that knowledge. Um, it's still a bit frustrating to see that people don't really care about the facts and they still make, you know, the, still ch the same choices. And look, I think that that's something that we as democracies have to have to reckon with that we are living in an era right now where there are people who are choosing misinformation. They are choosing to believe conspiracy theories. I think what we have to do is focus really on what the facts are, right? And it can be really frustrating. I mean, certainly it, it was frustrating during the period around January 6th to know that we had been so clear uh, and tried so many different ways to explain how uh, the election had proceeded, to explain that there was no fraud and there were still people who were willing to believe that uh, that there was fraud so much so that they stormed the Capitol. Yeah, that is that is a frustrating thing. But I do think that you know we have to stay very focused as journalists on you know, on not being um, personally antagonistic toward the politicians we cover because every time that happens, it lessens our ability to focus on those facts. Right? If you can look back at a reporter's Twitter account and see that they're you know, launching some personal digs at the politician or the president, whoever, prime minister, whoever it is, that really uh, undermines your credibility when you go to say, hey, I'm just trying to show you the facts here, right? So I think it is that kind of constant balance here, but yeah, I mean, it certainly is frustrating to me to know that there are people who are choosing actively to believe misinformation and conspiracies over facts, but that is, that's a big societal problem. You know, it involves technology, uh, it involves, you know, our politics, certainly our media, um, and it involves our willingness to all be good citizens as well. So that actually leads me uh, to my last question uh, directly. Um, as you probably know, uh, Israeli politics are extremely contentious and divisive, uh, especially now, uh, in a way that makes it, uh, I think, very difficult for uh, many journalists uh, to stay uh, objective while reporting the truth. I mean, the truth uh, isn't always convenient for many uh, uh, Israelis as uh, other nations. Um, uh, sometimes, it, you know, that's even the majority. So. Um, do you have any uh, tips for uh, your Israeli colleagues? Yeah, no, certainly. I mean, I've been following what's I've been following a lot of the the news out of Israel closely. It's it's fascinating um, and so many parallels uh, at points in so many ways. You know, with with what we've been going through here in the in the U.S. At least not boring. That's for sure. it's not boring. It's a, we're we are all blessed to be covering some really interesting times and very interesting people, um, like the Chinese curse, right? When you uh, yeah, <laughs> right. Exactly. I mean, I would say a couple of things about it. I think that I think that one of the things that you want to do as a journalist, you know, even if you've been in this business for a long time, is to every now and then, you know, take a moment and just actually ask yourself, you know, am I bringing a personal bias to this situation? I mean, I have found moments uh, in my career and not just covering President Trump, but I've found moments in my career where I've had to say, oh, wait, I might actually be thinking about this through a kind of personal lens as opposed to my professional journalistic lens. And there's nothing wrong with kind of acknowledging that to yourself. And then really, I think in those moments, taking extra pains to make sure that you're thinking through, you know, the other arguments around it, that you're spending more time talking to sources who are, you know, who are on another side of an issue and really making sure um, that you have a deep understanding, not just of kind of the facts over there, but also the motivations. Um, I also think sometimes, you know, we've all we've all um, been in situations where sometimes 
journalists realize that they no longer can keep their personal opinions or biases you know, to themselves, and maybe it is time to to move on. Um, but for those of us who who want to stay in the game, you know, I think it's really um, it's really important to be aware that we all do come to the table with with some biases. We're human beings. This is a human enterprise. We all have our own experiences. Um, and then, as I said, to spend just extra time really making sure that you are doing the reporting, the legwork uh, to understand, you know, parts of an issue that might not come as naturally to you. And then the other thing I would say is to have, you know, some real clarity on what your mission is. The way I always explain it to our newsroom is exactly, you know, as I said it to you earlier here, my mission is not to influence how people vote. My influence, my, my job is not to influence uh, whether you support a certain politician or not. My job is to give you all of the information, good, bad, ugly, that you need to make that decision. And if I've done my job well, and I've put all of that information out there, and it looks really bad for a politician, and you still choose to support that politician, that is your choice. In a free society, that is your choice. But I'm going to give you all of the information that you need. I'm also gonna give you good information when it comes up too. I'm not gonna cherry pick and say, I'm only gonna cover this politician negatively and this politician positively. I'm gonna give you again, the good, bad, and the ugly, but my job is, is as a provider of information, factual information. And then it's up to you as the public to decide what you want to do with that information. But I think it's really important for us as journalists to make sure we have that, that real clarity of mission. Well, um, with that uh, clarity of mission, um, we'll end this interview. And thank you so much, Julie, for joining us. Thanks for having me. Really appreciate it.